Well, here we are at the noon hour. We are back. We are live. This is Marco Mengelsdorf here in what I call the People's Republic of Santa Cruz, beautiful California, where I am teaching this quarter at University of California, Santa Cruz. And I am so, so very pleased to start out the month of April with my friend, State Senator Laura Ocasio, who represents the uh, first uh, Senate district, if I'm not mistaken, from the east side of Hawaii, my hometown in Hilo. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mahalo Nui for joining me today. I'm just so, so pleased to have you on, Laura. Ah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Marco. It's a wonderful honor to be here. Well, we're going we're gonna to go hopefully in all kinds of fascinating places during time together. But I think my, my first uh, intro question to you is going to be, what brought you into politics? Yeah, okay, so that actually takes me way back to my childhood, um, actually growing up in a very politically aware um, family, politically involved. Um, some of my earliest memories are actually of my father um, hosting solar power awareness parties in maybe the 1980s, probably 1984. Um, and as just a, a part of his contribution to the uh, raising of awareness around the need for solar power, and this is way back in the day. Um, so, you know, oftentimes in my family, we would have talks around the dinner table, we'd be uh, taking us to public meetings and just teaching us to engage civically. Um, a typical field trip in my family might be to the water reclamation plant, for example. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I also then got my bachelor's degree in geography here in University of Hawaii at Manoa and um, subsequently um, got into a bit of resource management positions and uh, studying ecology. And it, it really occurred to me though that the future is in our, in our students. And so I began emerging into the field of education in 2012. Um, most recently, however, um, well actually in around 2016, I really uh, started seeing the need to get involved in our local democratic party. Uh, and, and be at the table. I recognized that it was a, quite an exclusive um, group and a lot of decisions were made uh, without much input from, from the extended community. And I felt like my voice was not necessarily uh, uh, a, a part of that. So I wanted to just jump in and be involved and felt like if I don't join the table, someone else perhaps will. And I think that, that bringing that voice to that table was really important. So I got involved in the Democratic Party and started learning about local politics, um, which I had felt, been following myself uh, continuing as a, as a constituent, but just got more involved. And then in the vacancy of uh, Senate District 1C, when Congressman Kahele moved to Congress, uh, I uh, put in my name for application and was appointed by Governor Uge in January 2021. So that brings me to where I'm at now, and I'm so grateful for all I have learned and grown in the last year and a half in this position. Super. So you had uh, you had a one in three chance, I believe, once uh, your name was submitted, right? How surprised were you that you you were the winner? I was incredibly surprised um, in a lot of ways, although. I do, do have to say that many folks around me said that it gave them hope and that they weren't surprised. They appreciated that I was um, there to represent their voice now in the state Senate. And um, uh, I think the biggest emotion and feeling that I had was complete humility and reverence uh, because to be able to represent a larger group of people and you know to take that job seriously is an incredible honor, um, especially in things like, you know, um, who had, you know, which has very deep roots and culture. And um, yeah, I just feel really honored to represent Kilo and the people of Kilo. So one of the questions I'd like to ask everybody who uh, has the, the kindness of coming on the show is what in, in your, your position now as Hawaii State Senator, and this is the, your, your second, uh, second legislative session, if I'm not mistaken, the first one being last year, what has uh, surprised you the most? Because you know we go into to a new job, a new position, with all kinds of expectations, preconceived or otherwise, about what the job is going to be like. And given that life is um, it can be surprising to say the least, 
and unpredictable. What what has surprised you the most as you've been getting your your sea legs, so to speak, there in the Senate? Great question. I love this question. Um, so, a couple of things come to mind, uh, Marco. And one is that things aren't always as they seem. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of times we get a lot of our information via press and media, and they don't always get it right. And so and they also can potentially put spin, whether it's on purpose or not, it's just it, it happens. And so I think that's an interesting part because being in the Senate, you get to witness and see a lot of the inside conversations and, and potential even baseball that happens um, amongst cha the chambers and and to, to have that perspective is, is quite unique. And it, it really made me grow in my own self, actually, as far as my own assumptions and presumptions about things and, and kind of take a step back and really um, analyze. Um, but one thing I do want to say in terms of that surprise is um, that I'm really surprised at the degree at which legislators, including new legislators coming in, are expected to conform uh, to certain protocols that really ultimately serve um, Senate leadership and or Senate, I'm sorry, the Senate first and foremost, as opposed to having really deep critical thinking um, on um, and little engagement on issues, very little discussion um, and, and really actually no deep debate. And part of that is that the legislative session is crammed into a really short, period of time where a lot of things, a lot of issues come through. And so, so really having the, the deep, robust discussion around some of the issues, especially um, unintended consequences, don't always have the opportunity to come out. And so um, an example in terms of, you know, questioning protocols too is, is, for example, the unilateral control that a chair has in, um, in what bill gets heard and really in terms of what, how the bill, whether it comes out or not and in what form it comes out. And that was very surprising to me because I don't feel that that necessarily represents a constituency voice. And it also uh, it is accepted as politics and a political norm. However, it, it, it doesn't question the the nature of it being a violation of our constitutional right for equal representation, meaning then chairs have actually more control or more power, I should say, in terms of the outcomes of legislation than do senators of other districts if they're not chairs. And so that was actually very eye-opening for me and a very useful tool in terms of civics and, and being a civic leader and how I go about um, navigating in that um, protocol, if you will. Well, of course, you know, what you're talking about is something I've referred to uh, in my own mind, at least as the tyranny of the chair, which, uh, you know, it's not unique by any way, a stretch or form uh, to Hawaii by any stretch. That's certainly the case in the U.S. Congress, and I'm sure in uh, most, if not practically all, of legislatures uh, across the mainland U.S. What do you think is a would it be a practical and realistic and not too much of a Pollyanna uh, fix or solution to that without getting, you know, without seeing the committee process turn into something of a circus? How, how do you democratize what goes on within legislative committees so that there are more voices heard, so that there is more democracy, right? More exchange of views and more input. How, how would you, if you could wave your Laura magic wand, how could you fix that? That's a good one. I think some suggestions around that would be to, um, for example, if so many members of the Senate or so many members within the committee would like to hear a certain bill, like maybe they signed on as an introducer and would have a, a, a number, let's say 10 or even a majority, like we have 13, because we have 25 senators in, in the state of Hawaii. Um, if 13 sign on to a bill, that it would automatically get um, get heard in committee. For example, again, trying to br again bring in more of a voice of the rest of the membership, which means the rest of the state constituency that um, can help determine what gets heard. 
Um, another piece is that in a structural shift in terms of leadership would be that members actually do engage um, and, and chairs engage more with their membership um, and uh, you know come up with solutions and, and, and allow that dialogue rather than just having uh, more unilateral. Uh, and you know there's a, and another piece too would, could be a more a, a robust rotation system where you know you don't have someone who's been in the Senate for 13 plus years who's never had a chair, chairpersonship, for example, uh, that people would get given the opportunity at, at different points to rotate through them. And again, without it would have to be designed obviously with some pretty uh, deep experience and intentions in terms of not making it a, a surface like you say. Um, so that's one way, but I honestly think a big part of it is just, um, you know, and moving away from those these expectations and and really uh, being able to, to basically having uh, legislators who are willing and and know that their obligation is to read the bills and do due diligence around all of the language within the bills and to be able to communicate back and forth with their their chairs. That's, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, given, you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the power distribution in the Hawaii State Senate is there are 24 out of 25 members who are Democrats. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a legislative body on the mainland that has uh, that or perhaps even a major or, or a, a unanimity in terms of having all votes, but it's 24 to 1 with uh, Senator Kurt Favela being the lone Republican, kind of similar similar to Sam Slom when he was the lone Republican. And within that group of 24 state senators who are Democrats, there are those uh, who have more power, right? More influence, and there are those who have less power and less, less influence. That's kind of kind of the way of the world to some extent, right? So, Given that you're, uh, you know, somewhat of a newbie there, right, and you are going to be running for re-election in, in the months to come, uh, what kind of difference do you feel that you are making, that you have made so far uh, in your, your time there at the Senate? Uh, okay. That's a beautiful question. Thank you for asking. I, I think a big piece is just coming at it. Um, and not and doing my best to not get entangled in those political expectations, <clears throat> and to really excuse me, really um, move away from those expectations um, and maybe norms that where I understand how they evolve and the need for um, mutual respect, for civility, for decorum. Those are all very important, and yet. <clears throat> And yet not necessarily going along with things just because that's how it's been done in the past. Part of what has come up for me in terms of even looking at the election is that there's a fear factor that can come into play if one allows it, which is, oh, if I don't go along with this, then I perhaps won't be reelected. And when I sit with that for myself, I feel like I trust my path. And so you know, there's work to do in, in all realms. And I would absolutely, I, I'm joyful in the work that we're doing here by reading all the bills. That's part of, I think the difference that I'm making is, is setting that bar and that example of, of reading the bills and asking the questions during hearings so that we can tease out some of these really important aspects of really how to make a bill better and how to have it be um, a reflection of, something for the greater good, the more common good, um, um, you know, and, and, and looking at that, um, you know, approaching these discussions, like I said, with Bo Aloha is a big piece to it, but really taking critical thinking skills in all of the legislation that comes before me and, and looking at what, you know, we can offer those eyes and ears, and in being those eyes and ears is, is a true reflection of constituency. Just to tag onto that one tiny bit is that 
one thing that, <clears throat> that I feel like I bring is also listening to all of the voices. Because even though I personally may have a certain viewpoint on an issue, it is really important that I listen to uh, opposing viewpoints, or especially if there's multiple pieces to it, because I feel like that's a big part of where the answer lies is in a lot of that, and not necessarily in the sense of compromise, but just in, the, in, in being able to really investigate um, the issue at hand and to listen to the constituency. Um, and, and that's really my job, I and mean, that's part of the due diligence. Um, so. I'll just drill, you know, spend a little bit of time on energy issues because that's, of course, what I've devoted a lot of my life uh, professionally for over the decades. And uh, energy, of course, is a very big deal these days. It's hitting people hard in the pocketbook for utility prices are at a record high. Gasoline is at a record high. Not knowing, uh, you know, when that's going to peak because we don't know it's peaked until we're on the other side of the peak. So it is still peaking. Right. So what is going on, Laura? What's going on in the Senate these days and for the balance of the session regarding energy issues? What's 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 on your plate? What's on the Senate's plate as far as energy? Um, well, one of the first is that we will be um, we're waiting to have a, um, a scheduled hearing on the Public Utilities Commission uh, committee member commissioner uh, that was appointed by Governor Ige, Naomi Kauai. Um, I think right now senators are in process of interviewing Mrs. Kauai and, um, you know, formulating, doing their due diligence and research um, as I am myself <clears throat> and uh, taking into consideration as well um, public input and, and voices that have, are reaching out from the community um, in this realm. So I think that's a really big one. Um, so far, I have not seen that um, her nomination is, is or her um, uh, governor's message is up for again. <clears throat> well, actually, if I may, if I may add to that, I actually I sent you an email earlier today because oh, I, I got a response. I sent an email to uh, Senator Rosalind Baker on Maui because she's the chair of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, and I got a, a quick reply from one of her staffers today. Very pleased to always uh, see government being responsive, right? And I was informed that. The plan, I believe, is to set schedule a hearing in uh, Senator Baker's committee next week. Okay. Next week, yeah. so that's that's the news on that. Just thank you for informing me. It's great. Um, I I was definitely I was on a plane this morning, so out of reception from that internet. Uh, wonderful to hear, and I my guess too on that is is to allow the Senate enough time to do their due diligence even before the hearing occurs. Because same thing, here's an opportunity to question, um, you know, public testimonials and folks who do come on that have um, support or concerns. And so long as we do our due diligence before, then that's a robust discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's wonderful. And then some of the other things we do have, uh, we're looking at. Um, a lot, there's a bill, Senate Bill 2720 that is still is moving in the house side, I believe, and it's allowing new electric vehicle charging stations and, and certain upgrades um, uh, and helping qualify for rebate. We also have um, 20, Senate Bill 2963 relating to energy efficiency, and it's requiring and establishing deadlines for state facilities and um, does uh, except for smaller facilities, but larger state facilities to adopt um, cost-effective energy efficiency measures uh, within their buildings. And so really coming from the state side, you know, similarly to our agriculture is if we uh, mandate procurement uh, for local agriculture, then we have a, you know, a huge impact in that, in that our procurement is very large. So that's the idea with that one. Um, 30, Senate Bill 3205, is another one that is still moving and that it authorized uh, the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation to temporarily reestablish the um, Hawaii Office of Naval Research Grant uh, Program and to provide 50 50% uh, matching grants to Hawaii awardees of alternative energy research grants from the Department of Defense and Naval Research. And so again, um, trying to incentivize and and motivate different ways that we, especially large energy users, to um, conform and, and adopt. 
Um, well, I got I got I gotta say, and this is one of my I'm gonna, you can cue the, the the squeaky violins here. One of the biggest disappointments I've had regarding the Hawaii legislature over the past five or six years is that uh, the efforts to try to establish a tax credit specific to energy storage has failed, 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 failed. It's made it into conference committee a number of times, but never got out of conference. And I don't even think such a bill was in play this past session, which is really you know, disappointing because with more renewables, uh, you need more storage. And this is a way of incentivizing uh, more storage to get, and we need not just a little bit more storage, we need ex exponentially more storage, but for whatever reasons, the, there hasn't been the political will to, to do that. So um, that's the way it goes. But I wanted to ask you, you know, in light of uh, Senator or state, uh, sorry, Hawaii County Mayor Mitch Roth uh, asking the governor on a number of occasions to declare a so-called energy emergency because of reasons we talked about before, as far as the, the, the bigger chunk, the bigger bite that energy is taking out of, of people's pockets. Is there anything that you are aware of or can think of that the state government can do, can do, should do right now to be able to mitigate the pain that uh, so many Hawaii residents are suffering now because of high energy prices? Yeah, Hawaii's energy costs have always been the highest in the nation. Um, that's a big, a big thing that we are aware of and we, we experience here as consumers. Um, now that the utility is no longer required to um, pay the avoided cost for renewable energy contracts, the state really should be doing all it can to find ways to take advantage of these, um, to, of take advantage of homegrown resources. Local ownership of energy project, projects is really important. We should be able to keep the profits here for further ventures and um, support the local economy. Um, and I think a big part of that too is in implementing, um, I, I mean, energy is also really consumed a lot in the transportation sector as well. So again, moving towards, you know, um, electric vehicle access, um, fleets, et cetera. That's really important. But also, like you said, that one of the biggest conversations is around firm renewable energy right now here in the Senate. And just to your point around battery storage, um, that shifts a lot of the conversation of solar not being firm to a much more firm and reliable source if you're able to incentivize um, battery uh, storage from batteries. As well, well, in, in drilling in the last room, this we have together here, Laura, drilling down into a couple of big islands uh, in particular issues. One, you know, the good news, as far as I'm concerned, is that the Public Utilities Commission has conditionally approved the Avi, uh, uh, amended and restated power purchase agreement between uh, Puna Geothermal Venture and Telco, which will bring over time, it will bring down the cost of Telco power to. The 85,000 or so uh, ratepayers on the Big Island. So that is in the works. And then, kind of one of the other big issues on the Big Island, of course, is the proposed power plant up in Pipekeo, uh, who, who Honua, aka Honua Ola, which uh, the folks behind that have been at it for a long time now, 10 years or so. And the PUC has a decision pending on that power purchase agreement. So, to kind of cut to the chase, what is your position? on whether the commission should approve that amended and restated uh, power purchase agreement before, uh, before it right now. Yeah, so there, I'm imagining drawing up their, um, their decision making uh, between now and the next uh, short amount of time. And I absolutely think that it's important for the consideration, um, the fact that this is a, they're looking at a 30-year contract uh, with the Public Utilities Commission, uh, oh, I'm sorry, with the Power Purchase Agreement, which will have significantly higher rates for consumers or for people and then eventually passed on to consumers. And so I think in terms of looking at the consumer advocate uh, with the DCCA and the state's position on uh, protecting 
the consumer in terms of having higher costs for 30, the next 30 years um, to, to, to behoove them to um, you know, really take that into consideration. And, uh, I, I would support that, absolutely, because we already, folks are already having a hard time with the current prices, and then if that increases it significantly, uh, even more so, for families that are much trouble. So, so to be clear, if I if I heard you correctly, you are not in support of the current PPA that is before the Public Utilities Commission now regarding Huhonua coming online. Correct. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's uh, probably there's have a whole show on, on on that subject matter actually. Yes, yeah, we've had uh, we've had Henry Curtis on a number of times. I mean, uh, I, I'm no stranger to the subject as well. I've spoken about it as well as well as uh, Jay Fidel. So I mean, the uh, uh, you know, as both someone in the energy arena and someone who is also studying it kind of from an academic perspective, you know, the, what's going on in our state, what's going on 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 our island, is uh, just so fascinating from so so many so many different levels. And, you know, comparatively speaking, we on the Big Island have it more better as far as uh, power generation, as far as uh, reserve margin is referred to in the utility business, compared to, let's say, Oahu, where the AES power plant, which has been burning coal these past years, and by the way, the coal-powered electricity that AES has been selling to HECO over the years has been at somewhere around four cents a kilowatt hour, four cents a kilowatt hour. It's the cheapest power that HECO is buying from an independent power producer. So once AES goes offline definitively in September, uh, automatically there's going to be a, an increase in Hawaiian electric rates because they're going to have to make up uh, that generation uh, purchasing it from more expensive sources. So it's, uh, you know, it's just so interesting to look from the Big Island to Maui, Lanai, Molokai, Oahu, and Kauai, that we're all in the same state, of course, but we're all at different kind of stages in our energy transformation, so to speak. And uh, you know, I think it's way cool because I'm kind of biased, of course, I'm a Big Island guy is that uh, we on the Big Island are running kind of neck and neck with our friends, uh, Kauai Island Utility Co-op, uh, in terms of the highest percentage of renewables uh, with KIUC being numero uno last year, and they are making great strides and uh, uh, the Big Island is uh, nipping at their heels. So I think that's a, you know, it's a great competition to see who can, you know, as I've been saying over the years, it's not renewables at all costs, it's renewables at it being cost effective and is getting more and more cost effective. So, well, State Senator Laura Ocasio, uh, it's been so sweet and so lovely to have you on. I hope we can have you again sometime in the uh, the months to come. But in the meantime, uh, mahalo nui and uh, ahui ho. Thank you, Marco, so much for having me. I look forward to more discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.